Hi, so my name is Rachel Krieger. I am one of the instructional learning consultants with LSA Technology Services. Um, and today we are going to be talking about digital accessibility for text and documents. Um, I do want to let you know that we do have um, two additional accessibility workshops coming up. So today we're focusing specifically on text and documents. Uh, tomorrow we will have one focusing on images and videos and audio. And then next week, um, we will have one focusing on uh, student uh, public facing projects that you may be asking your students to complete um, and what accessibility uh, guidelines uh, you might want to consider uh, when assigning those types of projects. Um, so if you're able to attend those, um, that would be a great complement to today's session. Um, so some quick logistics. Um, like I said, we're going to record. I will be sending out the recording after today's session so you can refer back to it. Um, and for anyone who's unable to attend, uh, the slides are shared in chat with you. Um, I will be sending those out after the session as well. Um, captions are available um, in Zoom if, you, if those are needed for you. If you have questions throughout today's session, please put them in chat. I have a couple of colleagues um, who are on the, on the uh, call with me today. Um, so they'll be answering questions in chat. And then of course, I'm hoping to save uh, a few minutes at the end to be able to answer questions as well. Um, all right, so today we're going to, hopefully you'll be able to walk away um, being able to make some of your documents, text documents, accessible through headers, um, uh, accessible colors and fonts, meaningful link text. Um, and then at the end, we will talk about PDFs um, a little bit as well. So I want to start um, by talking about the universal design for learning. Um, and the basic idea of universal de design for learning is that all of your content um, is available to all of your students. Um, so when creating your course materials, um, we really need to think about that a wide variety of students are going to be accessing these materials. Um, and they're going to be accessing them from a lot of different environments. So they might be um, looking at your content on a very small device, like a mobile device or a tablet. They might need to uh, be able to enlarge text. They might um, need the text read aloud to them with a screen reader. Um, or they may not be able to see um, or differentiate between certain colors. Um, so those are all different things that we need to consider when creating content for, um, for our students um, or for anyone who's going to be consuming that, that content. Um, so all of this is going to apply to, you know, any course materials that you have, syllabi, uh, course policy documents, Canvas pages, um, lecture slides, um, and any course readings that you're going to be giving your students as well. Um, so I want you to think about the role that information technology plays in your life and how you access content on the web. Um, and then think about now if something about that information um, kept you from accessing it. Um, so maybe you weren't able to enlarge it um, or maybe you weren't able to differentiate between colors that were being used in that. Um, maybe you weren't able to listen to it. Maybe you had a, um, um, some, you know, audio impairments, visual impairments that require you to, to listen. Um, and what we really want to do is take away those barriers for our students, um, make it as easily accessible for them to access the content that we're teaching them in our courses. Um, so that's what really makes our content accessible is by removing any of those barriers so that all of our students can understand and access our content. 
So I did include um, some guidelines and policies for you today. You're more than welcome to dive deeper into these resources. Um, the web content accessibility guidelines, um, those are there to kind of help guide us in what makes a document accessible. Um, and it does align with U of M's current um, electronic and information technology um, accessibility policy that has been in place um, for several years. Um, so feel free to dive into those. The WCAG is very overwhelming. There's a lot of information, um, but hopefully today the, the purpose of attending today's session is to get some, you know, very quick, simple things that you can do um, starting today uh, to your course materials so that you can make an impact. Um, and those small, small little changes that you do to your content is going to make a big impact for all of your students. All right, so we're going to dive into those guidelines. Um, so the first one is page hierarchy. So this is the structure of your document. Um, and headers um, are really important and essential. Um, because they give your document a consistent visual and concep conceptual kind of coherence for your page. And it also allows screen reader technology um, to be able to give a page summary and to enable navigation for the user if they are having to listen to it um, and have the content read to them. Um, so some best practices to think about. Um, are to organize your headings in a very clear and logical manner. You don't want to skip headings. So, and by headings um, in, and I'm gonna show you this in just a couple of minutes, but in your word processing um, programs, there are designated headers that you can use. So the title header and then header one, two, three. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you're not jumping or skipping any of those headers. Um, you don't wanna go from header one to header three and then the screen reader is going to get confused of you know, why header two is missing. You also want to ensure that your headers are at least two points um, for font size larger than your body text. And that's just going to help for um, visual um, hierarchy and improved readability. And then to keep your headings very short and descriptive, um, that's going to allow readers to just kind of easy, easily navigate your content and then also kind of anticipate what the content's gonna be about, be able to skim your documents and be able to kind of find different sections or parts that they're looking for um, very quickly and easily. So in Microsoft Word, in Google Docs, in the Canvas uh, pages, a uh, rich text editor, you're going to have the option of what's called styles. And these styles are kind of built in um, header, heading structures. Um, and you can use those throughout your document to help set up this um, page hierarchy. And you can, within those styles, there is a default for like text and um, font style, font size, but you're not stuck. If you're using these styles, you're not stuck with these default settings you can go in and adjust those um, to your liking as well, and then kind of save those so that those are your default um, styles every time you go to create a new document. Um, all right, so in addition to headers, um, lists and tables kind of fall under this same principle. Um, you want to make sure that you're format formatting them properly so that they will stand out both visually and audibly. Um, so some best practices to keep in mind are that you don't want to hand number your list or you don't want to use symbols like the asterisk or the little dash mark to create those bullet points because a screen reader isn't going to know that you're wanting that to stand out as a distinct list. Um, and so you want to use those predetermined, those little buttons in your word processor for an unordered um, list, which would be your bullet points, um, or your ordered lists, which would be your numbered list. 
And then, um, whoops, this keeps jumping around me here. Um, you wanna keep your tables as simple as possible. Um, something to keep in mind with tables is, is that a screen reader is going to read a table um, from top to bottom, left to right in a very linear order. Um, so it's going to have a really hard time if you have a lot of merged cells or if you nest another table inside of a table. Um, and so you want to keep your tables very, very simple. Um, and then you also want to use and designate your header rows and columns um, just like you would in your text document with your headers. Um, and I'm going to show you what that looks like and how to go about doing that. So here's this example of, you know, you want to use your little bullets um, or your numbered list, that little button there in order to create those lists instead of typing out, you know, one, two, et cetera. Um, and then same thing with tables here. Um, you can use uh, some of the styles that are already within your word processor to format those tables. So I'm going to jump out of our PowerPoint right now, and I'm going to show you what that looks like in a couple of different programs. Um, so I'm going to start with Google Docs, because um, I typically use that most often. Um, so I have a, a Google Doc here with some text. Um, and right now, the text is just regular body text. Um, but I want to be able to see if this document has the appropriate hierarchy or structure. So I'm going to come up to view and I'm going to say I want to show the outline for this document. So I'm going to click on show outline. And right now I don't have one. Um, so it's saying that I have to add headers in order for this document to have an outline. So right now a screen reader is not is just going to read this from top to bottom. It's not going to let the the user know that there are some different headers, and it's also not going to allow the user to navigate easily through the document. So I could typically this is what I used to do before I became knowledgeable about creating an accessible document is I would just visually create some headers. So I would highlight my title, I would increase my font size to make my title stand out, and I might bold it and change the color um, to something different. But you can see that just because I did that visually, it created that, that header or that title, but it didn't do anything over here on the left-hand side for my outline. Um, so what I need to do is rather than mess around with the, um, the font size and the color and bolding, I'm going to use the predetermined styles within my document. And that's going to, in Google Docs, that's going to be right here with styles. So I'm going to select title. And that's going to automatically visually create that distinction between the title and the body text. But now I just added an item over here to my um, page outline. And I can do the same thing. So this first section here, I want to make a header for that, a, um, a section of text. So I'm going to click header one. And then I have some body text there. Same thing. So I'm just going to kind of go through my document and add those headers in. Um, and then in this accessibility guidelines section, I'm now going to start to have some subheaders. Um, so I can use then header two, and I can go through and add those in. And so you can see over on the left-hand side, I'm getting this really nice kind of outline or table of contents for my document that's going to make it really easy for anyone who's reading my document. They can go over here and click on any of these, especially if I have a really long document, several pages. I can click on any of these, and it will take me to that place in the document. And then this is also going to be make it um, accessible for anyone who's listening um, with a screen reader. Um, now, I can always go through and I can update the style of these. So let's say I really don't like the font for the title. I want to change that. I can go in and change the font um, if I want to, and I can change the size. 
And then I can highlight that and I can go over here to my title and say, I wanna update the title to match. Um, and then that's going to apply that. So every time I now in the future select title, it's going to apply that same styling that I just created for the title header. And I can do that for any of my, um, for any of my headers. If I wanted to change the color and I could say, I wanna update um, heading one to match and see now it automatically changed all of my header ones to that blue color. Um, with um, a list, so let's say I wanted to add a list here. Um, so enter rather than, like I was saying, rather than using the little dash mark and kind of creating my own little um, bullet point there, I just wanna make sure that I'm using my bulleted list or my numbered list in order to uh, create that, that list there. Um, with a table, so let's say I wanted to enter or uh, create a table here. So if I wanna insert a table, um, I can go ahead and do that. Um, and then what I wanna do um, when I'm in that table is I want to um, come up to table options um, or table properties. Um, and this is going to allow me to um, change uh, several things within my table. And then if I highlight my row, my first row here, because typically my first row, row, uh, row will be kind of that, um, that label for your, for your data. So maybe I have, you know, time, um, maybe I have date, um, and then I have all of my data underneath that. And so I want to designate this row um, as, my, um, as my header row. Um, so, whoops, I am going to come to, whoops, sorry. I can designate that as my, um, header row. Um, I'm going to move on to... Um, Microsoft Word. Um, so I do have, it's very similar, so I'm not going to go through um, as extensively with Microsoft Word, but just to show you that the, um, the same functionality is there in Microsoft Word. Um, if I wanted to um, designate my title up here, my styles look like this in this kind of window pane here. So I can say that is my title. I can also designate header one here. And it will do that then for me for the entire document. Um, I can also, if I come over to the styles pane, I do have that option if I wanted to update or change the text um, or the, the color, the font size, I can do that over here so that every time I use header one, it's going to keep that same styling. Um, for tables um, in Microsoft Word, um, so I can insert um, a table here. Um, and then once I do that, I am going to get this tab up top that says table design. Um, so there, that's where I can go ahead and select any of these kind of predetermined table formats. And that's automatically going to um, put that header uh, row up at the top. Um, so let's say I want to use um, this one here. Um, it's not too accessible of a color, so let's choose this one. So that's automatically now gonna, gonna indicate to a screen reader um, that that top row is my data labels, my header row. Um, and then the same thing for Canvas, um, since a lot of people are creating content on Canvas pages, um, the same thing is going to exist in the rich text editor. So I have a Canvas page here, I'm gonna edit. Um, the one thing to keep in mind with Canvas pages is um, when I go to my styles, it's gonna automatically start at header two instead of header one um, because there is a separate text box for the page title. So you're gonna enter your page title up here and it's gonna automatically designate that as header one so that the screen reader knows that header one 
um, is the title. Um, and then I can do the same thing here and I can go ahead and select header two, header two, header two. And then now I'm coming, getting into those subsections. So header three, et cetera. Um, so I can do that. Um, when entering a table um, in uh, Canvas, um, so I have table, so I can cr um, create a table here. Um, and then the, the table properties um, in Canvas are slightly different. I actually have to kind of highlight this row here. And then I'm going to click on table. And I'm going to go to row properties. And then within row properties, I can say, what type of row is this? Is it a body text row um, or is it a header? And so I'd want to make that very first row my header row and save that. Um, and then that will now um, designate that as the, as the header. Um, if I wanted to show some visual distinction of that, I could, because it doesn't change anything visually, I can go back up to table row and properties. Um, and if I go to advanced, I can select like a background color um, so that that first row is kind of visually, it stands out as the header row. Um, and then you would want to save, I'll find my screen here, I'd scroll down and save. Um, and then you can go ahead and see on the page there um, that it applied those header structures um, and that table. Of course, I, I didn't have any content in my table, so it's gonna look a little funny. All right, um, so that brings us to the next guideline um, that is color contrast. So th thinking about various colors that you're going to be using um, on your documents. Um, so color contrast really refers to the difference between the brightness of the foreground and the background. Um, so in text documents, the foreground is typically going to be your text and the background is the background color of the document. Um, and so some best practices are to use um, a contrast a color checker um, to make sure that your ratio between the text and the background is at least 4.5. Um, and that's gonna be for body text. And then if you have larger text, like your headers, um, your title, um, you'll need a three to one ratio um, for those larger text. Um, there is a caveat with pure black and pure white. Um, those are such stark colors that if they're used together, um, sometimes they can create some eye strain. So it's better if you're using black and white to choose one of them to be slightly either off black or off white. Um, so it's not so stark and, and creates people to strain their eyes. Um, if you are placing text over an image, um, it's best practice to create some sort of overlay or background behind the text um, so that you can increase that contrast and readability. Um, and then you don't want to use color um, as the only way to convey information. Um, that there are um, folks that have visual um, impairments uh, with color deficiencies, um, color blindness, and it's going to make it very difficult for those people to distinguish between various colors. So if you are using colors to show meaning or to show information, it's always best practice to um, also find an alternative way to share that information. And I have an example of that for you in just a moment. Um, so here are some uh, examples of some color contrast. Um, you know, we have a gray scale here, the, the lighter gray with the, with the black um, text. Of course, our Michigan colors, the navy with the, with the yellow on top. Um, and then the bottom two are very low contrast. Those are gonna be much more difficult um, for people um, who have visual impairments um, or, you know, <clears throat> low visibility to be able to see those. 
So there are some tools um, that you can use to help you. Um, so the University of Michigan does have um, a branding website and on that website, they offer colors that have been pre-selected um, for you to use. Um, and they also share um, some accessible options. Um, so if you choose to use those colors, it will let you know, um, yes, you can use this color on a light background or a dark background. Um, so that's very helpful. LSA um, has the same thing. Um, so LSA has some of their own specific colors um, that have been pre-chosen that you can use. So both of those resources are very helpful when choosing colors. Um, but this contrast checker um, is also really helpful. Um, so I kind of want to show you what that what that looks like here. Um, so I'm able to go ahead and put in various colors. You'll need the hex code for that color. Um, so I do have the hex code for um, a color here. Let's go ahead and enter that in here. Paste that in there. So this is the Michigan yellow. Um, and it's showing me that if I put this yellow color text on this light blue background, it is not going to be accessible, accessible per, for people to see. Very poor all the way around. Um, so if we change the background color um, to be, um, let's see, maybe the Michigan blue color. Whoops. Um, we're going to see that it's going to be much more accessible with that darker blue background um, for, for me to use. Um, I could also, if I wanted to see how does this yellow play out on a, you know, all white background, um, you know, it's not going to be very accessible there. So you can kind of play around with your colors to make sure that they are above that um, 4.5 uh, rating. Um, so again, we don't want to use color um, as the only way to, to convey information. So you can see in this example here of these um, charts, um, anytime you have a bar graph, a chart, um, whether you are, you know, showing some distinction of, you know, yes, this is available. No, this is not available. If you're using that with color, a lot of people like to use red and green. Um, red is, nope, it's, it's, you know, an error or it's not available. Green is, yep, everything is good. Um, green and red um, are those two colors um, that are very difficult um, for people who are colorblind to distinguish between. Um, although there are various types of colorblindness, that's the most common. Um, so you want to make sure if you are using color, you can use color, it's okay, but just make sure that you are adding in some other element that's going to show that same meaning to people who can't distinguish between colors. So you can see the example on the right hand side, in addition to the colors, they've also added, you know, dotted lines, dash line, solid line to show that meaning as well. This is also helpful for if your students um, print um, any of your resources. So maybe they print it in black and white. Um, I need some other way to distinguish between those colors because if I print it in black and white, now those colors, you know, I, I might not be able to tell which is which. All right, so this takes us into um, typography um, and that's gonna, um, really focus on the kind of look and feel of your text, right? Your font style, um, the size of your font, the spacing of your font, um, that's, an, you know, how that is going to be accessible for people. Um, so best practices are to keep it simple. Um, we really don't want to be changing between font styles frequently. Um, you know, maybe choose one or two font styles. Um, have your headers be one font style and have your body text be another. Um, it's recommended that you use a sans serif font uh, for your body text. There is a lot of research around um, the readability of different font styles. Um, so I provided a couple examples there of um, sans serif fonts. And then to reserve using those serif, those little fancier fonts, um, for your headers, where the font is going to be larger, 
it's going to not, you know, it's going to be a lot shorter. Um, and so people aren't going to have to strain their eyes as much to read those. Um, and then if this is going to be um, available online for digital um, consumption, um, kind of that 16 um, point font um, for your body is really going to kind of be the equivalent to if I printed it out, if that was 12 point, that standard kind of 12 point font. All right, so that leads us into um, link text. Um, so link text refers to the actual clickable words um, that you have on a web page, um, a Canvas page, an email that is going to take me to an outside link or website. Um, and having meaningful link text is really going to allow users to kind of skim the page and know exactly where it's going to take them if they click on something. Um, so it's best practice to use the title of the destination website, wherever you're sending them with that link, to use that as the, the link text. Um, and then avoid using generic phrases like click here or read more. Those are the two that we see the most often. Um, if I get um, a publication, maybe um, there might be various articles. And if there's buttons that are just click here, click here, click here, read more, read more. When a user is using a screen reader, that's all they're going to hear. Read more, read more, read more. Um, and so there's not going to be any distinction of you know, what link goes to what resource. So you really want to make sure that you are choosing meaningful text for those links. So here's some examples of that. Um, rather than using, you know, click here, read more, um, you know, I want to actually um, put that written out. Um, check out directions on how to hyperlink. And then I've linked directions on how to hyperlink so that someone visually or someone listening audibly is able to know exactly what that link is going to allow them to do and take them to. Um, you typically do not want to, on a digital um, document, you don't want to have the entire URL listed out there, like in this example here, um, because a screen reader is going to try to read that out letter by letter. Um, so it's going to sound um, really terrible for someone who's listening to it, um, listening to the content. Um, however, if you are going to be printing, if the, the digital document is going to be printed, um, you do want to make sure that you have that full URL there because, of course, you can't click on a printed document. All right, so PDFs. Um, PDFs um, are used quite frequently. Um, however, um, they are unfortunately, um, you know, one of the hardest formats to make accessible. Um, they were never really designed. Um, oops, let me, for some reason this. There we go. Um, they were never really designed um, for accessibility to begin with. Um, they were designed to preserve visual formatting. Um, and so this means that PDFs are really great um, at making those really pleasing visuals um, for your students, for making flyers and handouts and things like that. Um, however, um, they are going to be very difficult um, to make accessible um, if you if you already have them and they are not accessible. Um, screen readers um, cannot read a picture um, and that's pretty much what a PDF is. Um, a PDF is made up of images. Um, and so it's very difficult for screen readers to be able to go through and read um, a PDF, especially if that PDF is untagged. Um, so some best practices to think about with PDFs is first and foremost, try to avoid using them when possible. Kind of try to minimize that use of PDFs. Um, PDF is appropriate um, when you need a document that looks and feels like a printed page. 
Um, you know, so maybe you have a web page or maybe you have a canvas page and you want to be able to have a printable and very easily printable version of that page. Um, it's very appropriate to have that web page, have that, um, have that um, maybe a flyer, um, maybe you send out an email for an event or something like that. Um, then you can have a PDF that accompanies that for people to print off if they needed. Um, but really all other context, there are much better formats to use than a PDF that's gonna be much more accessible and usable for everyone. Um, and that's pretty much everything that we've talked about so far today. So um, Google Docs, Word, um, web pages, Canvas pages, email messages, those are all going to be much more accessible, um, especially when we are you know, applying all of those guidelines that we talked about so far today. Um, some issues and considerations with PDFs. Um, so if you decide that you have to have a PDF um, or if there's some reason why a PDF is required, um, there is going to be some expertise required in order to make it accessible um, with using Adobe Acrobat Pro. So just keep that in mind um, that you'll need to gain some kind of knowledge and expertise in using um, Acrobat. Uh, remediating PDFs that are not accessible is very time consuming. Um, and even when you do remediate those PDFs, it's not going to be 100% foolproof. There are still going to be errors. Things will still need to be cleaned up by hand. Um, and PDF has an image layer um, and that, that doesn't change. It always looks the same because a PDF is preserving that visual format. So that means that people cannot easily change the size or the appearance of the text if they needed to zoom in or if they were viewing a PDF on a smaller mobile device, it's gonna be very difficult for those folks. Um, and um, yeah, like I said, those smaller screens and being able to zoom in, you're not gonna be able to do that. Um, so photocopies. Um, these photocopy PDFs are not going to be accessible. Um, so I see this a lot um, where you maybe have a book or a resource um, that you didn't have a digital copy of. <clears throat> and so I just took that book. I want my students to read chapter two of a book. <clears throat> and so I'm going to take that book to a photocopier. I'm going to copy chapter two, turn it into a PDF and distribute it to my students. Um, that PDF of that photocopied image, that is not going to be accessible. A screen reader will not be able to read that aloud to students. <clears throat> um, if you do have a photocopied um, scan PDF, um, it will need, in order to make it accessible, it will need OCR, which is um, optical character recognition. Um, and there are library scanners that will be able to help you OCR a, a document. Um, and then Adobe Acrobat Pro, um, there are some built-in features where you can um, OCR a document. Um, so if you do want to have a PDF, if there's some reason why you say, I need this document to be a, a PDF, there's some sort of, of need for that then the best option is for you to create that PDF from an original accessible document. Um, so what, I, what do I mean by that is I'm going to start with a document that is accessible. So I'm going to create that document in Microsoft Word. I'm going to create that document in Google Docs. I'm going to apply everything that we talked about today. I'm gonna to make sure that I'm creating that document using those logical headers. I'm using the correct formatting for my list and my tables. <clears throat> I'm using appropriate colors, meaningful link text. Um, we're not diving into alt text for images today. We'll get into that at the session tomorrow, um, but making sure to a lot of times PDFs will have images that go along with the text. So you'll wanna make sure there's alt text. Once I have that document accessible, then I can save it um, as a PDF. Um, and that's going to give me the most accessible PDF version um, in order to share out. 
Um, so here's kind of what that looks like in various formats, Microsoft Word, Google Docs. Um, in Microsoft um, Word, it's going to have me save as. Um, so sometimes there is an option, like if you go to print, then you might have under the print option, you might have save as PDF, but you don't want to use that option because that option will not appropriately tag your document. You want to make sure you're going to save as and then saving as a PDF. And same thing in Google Docs, it's gonna say download. I wanna to go to download, and then I wanna download as a PDF document. Um, so that is how to create a accessible PDF document from scratch if you are building it. And sometimes if you have a PDF document um, like that scanned um, photocopy option, um, Depending on the length of your document, it may be best to just recreate that document in um, Google or Microsoft Word and save it as a PDF. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Um, so I want to show you very quickly a PDF document and what I mean by this. Um, so let me move this out of the way and open up my PDF here. Now I can't remember where I put it on my desktop. There it is. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna open up this document. I'll leave it over here. <clears throat> I want to make sure you can see it. <clears throat> okay, so I have this PDF document. Um, and I want to kind of see if this document is accessible. Um, so one way um, I can do that um, quite, kind of quickly and very easily is just go up to, I'm, I'm in Adobe Acrobat, go up to view and then read out loud. Um, and I already had that activated. <clears throat> so I'm going to read out loud. If I highlight some of the text. Published letters of Benjamin Franklin author. S. Benjamin Franklin Soares. The Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography. So hopefully if you were able to hear that, um, it is reading that text out loud to me. However, this is the first section of this document. If I scroll down to the actual content of the document, if I highlight and say, read that out loud, it's not reading it out loud to me. Um, also, you can see when I highlight the text here, it's not highlighting the text appropriately. Um, and so that tells me that this document is not accessible. Um, a screen reader will not be able to read this document aloud. Um, so a couple of things that I can do, um, I can come over here to all tools <clears throat> and I can come down, I can, if I say view more, um, there is this option that says prepare for accessibility. If I click on that, I'm going to get a lot of different options, um, and I do have some links to additional resources if you actually want to dive deeper into Acrobat Pro and um, learn how to use all of these different functions. Um, I do have some resources that I'm going to share with you so that you can do that. Um, but here I can check for accessibility. Um, I can add alt text if I have images. Um, you know, I, I have some, you know, if I need to um, automatically tag the PDF, I can do that. Um, but the one I'm going to use right now is scan and OCR. Um, so it's that OCR um, that I need to have in order for um, a screen reader to be able to read that. So I'm going to say scan and OCR. I'm going to enhance the scanned file and I want to recognize the text. So I'm going to say enhance, um, and it's now going to, um, it's saying down here at the bottom that it's optimizing it. <clears throat> um, so now if I go um, and I highlight 
um, some of the text here. Um, you can see it is nicely highlighting that text now. Um, and if I copy that and paste it into a Word document, I will be able to do that. Whereas before, I would not have been able to, to copy and paste that text from the PDF document. Um, so now um, this is much better. Um, however, um, this, let's see, this document um, is still not accessible because um, I'm still not able to this read this. This content downloaded from 165-230-193-80 on Monday, January 25th, 2016, 20 hours, 37 minutes, and 0 seconds UDC all use subject to. Um, so you can see it still is reading some of the content on the page. Um, but when I highlight the actual text of the document that I want my, my students to read, it's still not reading that out loud to me. Um, so there's still something about this PDF that is, is not accessible. And that's because this PDF was photocopied um, from whatever original source it was. Um, so just keep that in mind with PDFs that you have. Um, and when you are choosing to use PDFs um, and, and when you could possibly use perhaps other options. Um, with um, Google Docs, I know a lot of times instructors um, will say that, you know, they want their syllabi to be a PDF because they don't want you know, students to be able to change dates or, um, you know, manipulate that document, um, which is very understandable, um, which you could put your syllabi on a Canvas page um, instead of having it be a PDF document. Um, or you could um, create a Google Doc and then sh change the sharing permissions on that Google Doc. Um, so that people, your students that have the link are only able to view and don't have editing capabilities for that particular Google Doc. Um, so there are some other options that you can think about and use, um, you know, to, to get away from using PDFs. Um, but of course, I know there are going to be instances where PDFs are required um, or you need to use them. And so, you know, just make sure that you are doing as much as you can to make sure that PDF is accessible as possible. Um, the library um, is going to have a lot of resources. Um, any of the um, materials available at the library, um, if there is a book and you need that book or um, a section of that book for your course materials, you can work with the library for them to be able to provide you an accessible version of that resource. Um, so make sure to, you know, check out the library and get in touch with their support um, so they can help you with that. Um, okay, so. Knock, um, knock, I knock. can I can I jump in? Oh yeah, it's, hi Rob, thanks. It's it's Rob from the library. Sorry, if <laughs> uh, I heard you talking about the library and mentioned it earlier and then I had a phone call and so I missed out. I, I'll just Please. jump in to say that uh, we have a wonderful book scanner on the second floor of Hatcher that lets you take basically pictures of pages. And one of the options is to recognize the text in the resulting PDF. Uh, so that's that's a, a great tool. Um, and then um, let's see, I'll track down. We don't actually have any tutorials out there about doing OCR, uh, but that's something that we'll, we'll create in the future because that um, it's really simple in Acrobat really, if you've got good clean text. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. Um, yes, so definitely if you need to, to photo um, copy scan those resources, use the, the resources that are available at the library, um, you know, photocopying them on your, on your home or your office printer um, is not gonna have the same capabilities as the, um, as the ones available at the library for you. Um, all right, so there are some additional resources for you. I have a whole bunch of them that I've included in the slide deck um, that you'll be able to uh, dive deeper into. Um, there is a 10-week accessibility challenge 
um, that you can sign up um, and be a part of. Um, so you'll basically get an email each week for 10 weeks that have different information, resources, best practices, and a little challenge task for you to complete. Um, so that will be offered in fall and again in winter. Um, so there's a link there for you to sign up for that. <clears throat> um, and then I've kind of sectioned out the resources based on the different guidelines that we talked about today. Um, so just kind of general accessibility, your page hierarchy, color contrast, descriptive text. Um, I do did include a, a section specific to Canvas accessibility um, and then PDF accessibility as well. Um, so here is my office contact information. Um, if you have any additional information um, or if you need help uh, making some of your cam um, course materials accessible, you can always get in touch with us. Um, and thank you for coming today. Um, so I will leave the rest of our time for questions. If you have questions, um, you know, you can put them in chat um, or if you'd like to raise your hand or unmute yourself, um, feel free to do that.